Chintamani. I got back my letter. I was reading a, they had a, ma a little cartoon about Prahlad Maharaj, and I was thinking, what a nice name, Prahlad. And at the same time, I got the letter from Shul Prabhupada for my initiation, saying, my, my name is Prahlad Ananda. So I said, wow, that's amazing. And then I heard from Devananda, who, who was Shul Prabhupada's secretary at that time, when he'd received my letter for initiation, he said, how can I initiate this boy? He said, there's no letter of recommendation. So, Devananda said, well, I just talked to him on the telephone, Srila Prabhupada, and he seems like a very nice devotee. So Prabhupada said, oh, you recommend him? So Devananda said, no, I, I mean, I don't even know him. How can I recommend him? I, I just talked to him. So Prabhupada said, so, if you think he's a nice boy, then I'll give him initiation. What really struck me the most was, was being in a room and in my mind, it's a huge auditorium, but I think it was the Boston Temple Room, which it's not that large physically, but it seemed to be lar extremely large. And it was filled with, with devotees, so there was standing room only, literally. And I was in the back of the room, and Srila Prabhupada was glancing around the room. And you know how your eyes, you meet someone, <clears throat> and my eyes and his eyes locked for the briefest fraction of a second. But I, you know, I felt that, that, you know, in this huge room, there was a personal connection between myself and Srila Prabhupada. And I didn't, at that time, of course, you know, everyone thinks, you know, they're special. But I didn't think that. I didn't think that, I, and I, because I realized that, that this person had the capacity to relate to every person in the room. That there was a, you know, there were, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't as though, it wasn't just that his, it was a survey glance. He actually connected with every person. I, since then, I, I understand a little more how he, he, why, or the process that he did that. But Srila Prabhupada was the, external manifestation of the super soul. I mean, not, he's not the super soul. He's a jiva soul, a perfected jiva soul. And because he is a perfected jiva soul, he is transparent to the paramatma, which is situated within everyone. So there was a direct connection because the paramatma within my heart and the paramatma within his heart we're connected. Or no, you and I, our connection is covered due to the false ego and the conditioning that we are in. But in his case, there was no covering. There was no false ego. So, so the spirit soul and the paramatma were in perfect harmony. So, there, so he could know perfectly what was in my heart because as much as the paramatma knows, he knows. And so throughout, since that time, uh, in, in meeting with him, I, I sensed that more, that he knew directly. I mean, you know, it said that, that the Paramatma is closer to you than, you're, than you are to yourself. I mean, there couldn't be anyone closer. And Srila Prabhupada was the direct connection. So when he spoke, I understood it to be that Paramatma was speaking. And... Um, I didn't understand at that time, but now I think I understand a little better that that was the case. And he, he ex explained that once. I wasn't present, but it's a famous story. I know that you've probably heard it many times, but I'll tell it again because it bears repeating. Um, he was in New York with Ramaswar. This was Ramaswar and some others were in the room. And uh, one of the members of the press asked him, uh, Does he, can he speak to God? I believe that was the question. And Ramaswar, and he said yes. And Ramaswar began explain to the reporter that what that really means is that the God is in, within is the intelligence. And when you take help from the intelligence, you're taking help from God to make it more palatable, perhaps, to the Western mind. Prabhupada stopped him emphatically and said no directly. So anyway, that so experience in Boston was uh, sort of astounding to me. I remember at the start of the lecture before the initiation, Srila Prabhupada sent two boys out of the room because they didn't have tea lock on. Boys were uh, 
named Girish and Birbhadra. Birbhadra, these were the sons of Shalavati, who had been living at New Vrindavan with us. They were nine, eight, nine, ten, something like that. So even though they were just boys, Prabhupada saw their faces. They didn't have tilak on. So he said, go put tilak. He just motioned them out of the room. Put tilak. And then while they were out of the room uh, anointing their bodies with tilak, Prabhupada started talking about tilak and how tilak was our trademark. We are selling Krishna for free and still no one will take. And when he said that, he just started laughing. His belly started... Right, no one will take. <laughs> he started laughing. And then Srila Prabhupada started giving a very intricate lecture, at least intricate to me. Perhaps I was just tired or whatever. I couldn't follow it, what, what Srila Prabhupada was talking about. And then finally, I started to catch on when his lecture was interrupted by Bhagavan Das's, who was a, Bhagavan was the president of the temple, his little baby son started clanging on the cartel, these cartels he had in his hand. Uh, Mother Krishna Bhamani was holding him and he started clanging on the cartels. And when the child did that, Prabhupada expertly used it in his lecture. He said, just like this child, he has had practice. So he, it, Prabhupada had been talking about transmigration of the soul. I had, hadn't been following it. And then when Prabhupada said he has had practice, he started beaming at this little boy. And then the little boy started beaming at Srila Prabhupada. We were looking at the boy, looking at Prabhupada. There was like a very dramatic pause. He has had practice. And it's like there was something going on between Prabhupada and this little boy. <laughs> and then I started to catch on. It was about transmigration. One time we were riding in the car. I remember it was, I was driving and Prabhupada was on the other side and uh, somebody was in the back seat and then Prabhupada said, so how old is Chandramukhi? And I said, uh, oh, she's two. And he said, so you could send her to Gurukul. And there was a Gurukul in New Vrindavan at that time. It was just uh, Shilavati's kids and maybe uh, Dwarkadish might have been there. And uh, so I said, uh, and she's five, Prabhupada. <laughs> he said, no, you can send her now. <laughs> but I thought, I thought, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I was visiting New Vrindavan out of curiosity. It was in the spring of 1970. So spring to me, I wasn't from Atlanta. It was spring there. It wasn't spring in New Vrindavan. It was very wintry still. I think it was March. And the devotees um, had obtained a plate of prasadam from Los Angeles, where Prabhupada was staying at the time. And they were passing out. They were making a big, you know, a, a, a big, a big uh, production out of the, this prasadam was from Prabhupada's plate personally. And I was very skeptical. But I happened to get a raisin from the plate. <laughs> and it was one of the, those uh, golden raisins. Prabhupada said the other ones were burnt. <laughs> he said burnt, or sometimes they, they look like insects. He didn't like the black ones. So I took this golden raisin and popped it in my mouth, and uh, I mean it was a, it was an experience. I mean it, it tasted like a golden raisin, but the intensity of the taste was magnified thousands of times. This day I love golden raisins. I still eat them. I, I, I began to realize what the devotees were talking. That this was an extraordinary. This was something extraordinary. This was this uh, personality was something uh, very different from what we'd experienced before or since, or any time. Another time I asked Srila Prabhupada, when I said, Srila Prabhupada, can I, should I control my desire to eat prasadam? Prabhupada started to chuckle, and he said, no, you can eat as much as you want. He said, but don't fill yourself up to here. <laughs> and he started to chuckle, and everyone started to laugh. So simple questions, nothing yes. really profound. Yes. And one time I asked Srila Prabhupada, because I, was a, I thought I was a Hatha Yogi, so I actually said, I said, Swamiji, uh, if Krishna wants me to do something, or if he doesn't want me to do something, how will I know what Krishna wants me to do? And Prabhupada said to chuckle, and he said, he said, you? He said, you won't know what to do. He said, you'll do the wrong thing. <laughs> everyone started to chuckle and laugh. And when Prabhupada heard, saw that everyone was chuckling and laughing, he looked at me, then he looked at me very, very compassionately just so I wouldn't feel offended. I was always very 
I always notice that Prabhupada is very, very sensitive to everyone he was dealing with. And then the next day was Vyas Puja. And Srila Prabhupada gave an address that's been published in different places, famous Vyas Puja address at New Vrindavan, 1972. And uh, Srila Prabhupada very intelligently started talking about the meaning of Vyas Puja and how um, the spiritual master considers himself the very humble servant of the previous acharyas and of Krishna. He doesn't think he's God Almighty, which is what one may have thought by seeing all this worship being offered to him uh, on the Vyasa San. There were many guests. Again, there were journalists, scholars, all kinds of people. So he started talking about how he considered himself the dog of God. I am the dog of God. Uh, he said, it's just like if you uh, want to please a very big man in this world, it's very difficult to even meet him or to, what to speak of pleasing him because he's so big. But if you simply give his dog a two-cent lozenge, Prabhupada said, then very easily he's pleased. So I am the dog of God. It is very difficult to please Krishna. I am very, it's very easy to please me. Just Jan Hare Krishna. So Jai and Srila Prabhupada, we had a big roaring kirtan. Oh, and then, oh, before the kirtan, no, Srila Prabhupada took questions. And Prabhupada in his lecture had been talking about how strong maya is. So the first question immediately when he took questions was from this long hair in the back, long-haired fellow. And he said, if the purpose of life is to know God, Krishna, then why is maya so strong? as though that were some kind of defect in Krishna's arrangement. So without a blink or a wink or a skip and a beat, Prabhupada said, your purpose is not strong. And Prabhupada said that with such power, again it was like we all went, <gasps> we were just blown away, completely blown away. Not just this fellow who asked the question, but we were all stunned by Prabhupada's quick and rapid reply to that question with such power and profundity, your purpose is not strong. And it was like he wasn't just speaking to that guy, he was speaking <laughs> to everybody. Morning walks. I remember one time taking Prabhupada to a park in Los Angeles and it was raining. And I was so worried, you know, that I didn't want Prabhupada to get a drop on his head or something, you know. So I kept, you know, I brought the umbrella and and, you know, I kept trying to put it over Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said, it doesn't matter. He said, I like the rain. <laughs> you know, he said that rain, I think it was winter time, and it was, he said, the rain it makes it a little warm. He said, anyway, he says, it rains in Calcutta. He said, this reminds me of Calcutta. And he said, I think he said that on a couple of occasions, that Los Angeles somehow reminded him a little bit of Calcutta. We went to the airport first, obviously in Boston, and uh, my wife gave him a garland. Which it's interesting because some they say that the women should not be allowed to give garlands to Prabhupada, Guru Puja, or whatever. She gave him a garland. She was not even initiated. I think she got initiated there at the time. She gave him a garland. And he smiled and, and he gave his hands. And then, so then he went to New York. And we went to see him in New York. Uh, I was Temple president at that time, I think. I, in fact, I became Temple president before I was initiated. That was the, some of the advantages of being in the frontier of Krishna consciousness. It was a temple, Atlanta was a small temple, and uh, Tallahassee opened up. Temple president was sent to Tallahassee to, to uh, manage that temple, and so, it was, so they asked me to be Temple president, so I became Temple president. So as it was, being Temple president was the advantage that you could write to Srila Prabhupada. That was a tremendous advantage because it, by that time they had Previous to that, anyone could write to Srila Prabhupada. But then he it was getting too much mail, so he asked that the Temple President may write on behalf of all the devotees. So there was a great competition to be Temple President that we could write to Srila Prabhupada. And also, you could, you could go to where Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada was visiting the U.S., you could go there, and then you could go into the room. So uh, we went into the room, myself and a number of the other Temple Presidents. And uh, he said, where are your wives? He said, where, where is your, we can't went in without the wives. And he said, where is the wife? He said, husband, uh, wife is protection for husband. When husband goes traveling, wife should also go. At one time I was there in a conversation with the person who had invited Rupanuga to come was 
His name was Dr. Lau. He was an Indian, and, but he was a Mayavadi. He had asked the devotees to open a center there, and Rupanuga came up and opened a center. But this Dr. Rao was never very surrendered. And I saw how Prabhupada preached to him, very, very simple. He was saying that Krishna, uh, the, uh, in order to know who your father is, who do you ask? He said, you have to find out from, you, from your mother. Or who is the authority of your father? Who do you find out who your father is? From your mother. And Dr. Lau wouldn't accept that. So Prabhupada re repeated the same an analogy three times. You know, if you want to know who your father is, you have to find out from your mother, the Vedas. And since Dr. Lau didn't accept that simple analogy, Prabhupada didn't go any further. He just stopped right there. And then Dr. Lau said, uh, Swamiji, I wrote one article for your Back to Godhead magazine, but it's never been published. And Prabhupada took his little bell and rang it. Pradumya came in and said, yes, and Tupra said that Mr. Dr. Lau has written one article for our Back to Godhead, and it has not been published. It must be published. So I say, Mike, it must be published? <laughs> that are, what kind of article could it have been? And then Prabhupada said, it's very important to write for Back to Godhead. Every, I want all my disciples to write for Back to Godhead. So I realized the importance of writing for Back to Godhead, and then I realized that this article will never be published. <laughs> but Prabhupada was very, very kind to Dr. Lau. So Srila Prabhupada gave a nice lecture, and then he began to sort of banter with the people, and he picked out the Indians. So he picked out this Mohanti. So he smiled and very cordial, and very friendly, very loving with this man. But of course, Mahanti was young enough to be his son, really. Mahanti was probably 40 something at the time. Dr. Mahanti, actually. So what part of India? Where are you coming from? He's from Arissa. But Mahanti was a little proud because he was an educated man and he was a PhD in biology. So he said, so probably said, So, why have you come? Where are you from? Marissa? So why you have come to the USA, to America? So I am a biologist, as though, you know, now be proud of me. I'm your countryman, and uh, I've succeeded in the material. I've got my degree in biology. I'm an important man, a professor. See, be proud of me. Frog said, oh, poor frogs. <laughs> and the room just exploded in laughter. So Mahanti, Mahanti, of course, he, Mohanty is nice enough to be, you know, the butt of, of the, he's a nice fellow. I mean, if it really hurt him, you know, she probably, probably wouldn't have done it. So Mohanty, Mohanty protested and he said, no, no, it is for science. It is for science. And Prabhupada laughed and he said, uh, he said, oh, we'll take your body for science. <laughs> And, and amid the, the, the laughter, Mahanti said, yes, yes, I'll do, I'll do. And Prabhupada just, he, he laughed, he said, no, no. He said, he said this, is, this is not, this, this, this uh, inquiry of, of science is not very important. It is better to study the Vedas, study the Srimad Bhagavatam. While going on a walk in Dallas uh, with Satsuri Maharaj and others, I guess Prabhupada uh, was asking, well, like, he was told that there was, uh, that Hunt lived across the river from where they were walking. Somebody told Prabhupada, right, across the river is H.L. Hunt, and he's the richest man, or one of the richest in the United States. And so Prabhupada then said, well, if you see him, what will you tell him? So then they, somebody said that, uh, oh, we'll tell him that we have a school here and we're producing first-class citizens, because Prabhupada was talking a lot about that. I was in context with what Prabhupada was saying at the time. And then Prabhupada said, no, you'll tell him he's a thief. <laughs> so then, you know, this is like, I heard the story and I thought, you know, along with a lot of other devotees, you know, how are we going to just go and tell this guy he's a thief or something, you know, <laughs> and stealing from Krishna. So, then I was with and I remember that story, but uh, so I was with Prabhupada in 1970s, 
76, beginning of 76, uh, as his secretary in uh, Mayapur, just for a month. Then uh, we were walking on the roof of the Mayapur building, and uh, Jai Pataka came with this life member, and the life member, you know, the, he introduced the life member to Prabhupada and said, uh, you know, this is Mr. So-and-so, and then he this man was very respectful. He was a man from Calcutta, industrialist, and Prabhupada said, so what is your business? He says, oh, I manufacture glass. I have a glass factory. And Prabhupada said, oh, very good. He says, so who, and uh, how, how do you, how, what's the manufacturing process? How do you manufacture glass? He says, well, it's, uh, it's done from, glass is made from silicon, or, and which is in, in the sand. Uh, so then Prabhupada said, uh, so who owns the sand? And then uh, the man, he's a pious man, he's a bright man, he said, uh, oh, Swamiji, says, Bhagawan owns the sand. And uh, so, meaning God owns the sand. So then uh, Prabhupada said, so you were stealing from Bhagawan? <laughs> And this was just, and everybody liked it, you know, they thought, oh, this is good, you know, Swamiji has sort of put this man on the spot, Prabhupada has put this man on the spot, and the devotees laughed, and the man laughed, and and he sort of faded back a little bit, and the topic changed a little, and then, and then he came back up again a few minutes later, next to Prabhupada, and he said, uh, he said, but, he said, uh, um, he said, Prabhupada, I'm, uh, I'm uh, giving in charity. He says, I give in charity. And Prabhupada said, oh, said, oh you were just a little thief then. <laughs> so he wasn't going to let him off the hook. <laughs> that was something. That I, and just thinking about it, I love to think about this. Two examples, like Prabhupada... It's like precept and practice, you know. <laughs> How are we going to call a big man a thief? But and you know, do it in such a way that it would be effective, you know. I mean, you could, a guy can slam the door on us or something. But here, Prabhupada did it in such a skilled way, <laughs> and the man was laughing after Prabhupada said that. <laughs> and then, you know, even then, he sort of tried to get off the hook a little bit, and and Prabhupada was. Saying, nope, I'm not going to let you off. <laughs> it's such a nice way to. So, during the question and answers, there was one j fellow from Jamaica who was a life member who was an industrialist in Jamaica. And Prabhupada had spent most of the lecture just blasting and hammering away at the materialistic civilization, the industrial, modern industrial civilization. This guy was an industrialist. So, he raises his hand Prabhupada! What about the wheels of industry? So without hesitation, Prabhupada said, stop those wheels. Whereas in other contexts, Prabhupada encouraged us to use the technology for Krishna's service, what have you. But in this case, Srila Prabhupada came down heavy on him, and he said, stop those wheels. So he must have known the man could hear that <laughs> in the right spirit. Because <laughs> Prabhupada, of course, was also using those wheels, turning him in a spiritual direction, Yukta Vairagya. They gave a, a Sunday feast lecture. There was, Atlanta is right in the middle of the Bible Belt. So many Christians. He gave a lecture about Christianity. Um, people, and some people, we had a lot of guests. And one, one fellow who gradually who became a devotee, his name was uh, Peter at the time. He's now uh, uh, huh? Param Paradas. So he, he, uh, you know, he, he was one of these uh, seekers who had studied many different. So when was another fellow who was into, very much into the Sikhs, the uh, 3HO ashram. So he had, so probably talked about Christianity and he taught, he talked to the Christians and he told them basically Christ is our guru and very nicely, that one very nicely. And then uh, this man in the back said, who is Guru Nanak, Sri Prabhupada? No, no. What, what happens to the followers of Guru Nanak? Prabhupada said, the followers of Guru Nanak are indeed fortunate. 
So being emboldened, now this other one, <clears throat> Prampradas, gradually became Prampradas. He said, Prabhupada, yeah, Prabhupada, yes. Who is Mayor Baba? <laughs> I do not know. There are so many bogus Babas. <laughs> Just know who is Krishna, that is sufficient. So it was wonderful. This man was, you know, he was very hard because we had been preaching to him, and he, but he was very resilient. But at that moment, he, he surrendered. He became a devotee, Prabhupada. It was very nice. One time Prabhupada came to the University of Buffalo and he was giving a lecture. And when he was giving the lecture, first he, he walked in and he sat down. He was in one of the, the rooms at the university. And there were so many students came there. And he asked Rupanuga, he said, which, which verse should I give? And, well, Shubhara just opened the book to this verse was uh, Sri Bhagavan Uvachi Man Vyushate Yogam Praktavan Ham Aviyam Vyusha Manave Praha Ano Ishvaka Ve Bravit. And he started to lecture from that. And then after the lecture, he asked for questions. And one boy stood up and said, Swamiji, he said, Tell us truthfully, are you really happy? And Prabhupada became very, very grave. And he looked at the boy and said, So? If I told you, would you believe me? And the boy goes, no, no, Swamiji, come on, tell us, are you really happy? And so Srila Prabhupada looked even twice as grave, and looked in the boy's eyes and said, if I told you, would you believe me? Oh, come on, Swamiji, just tell us, are you really happy? And then Prabhupada had this beautiful smile on his face and said, yes, I am very happy. And everyone goes, Jai Prabhupada! And then this boy, his big grin on his face turned into a big frown, and then he sat down. The devotees went, Jai! <laughs> so Prabhupada could, just by his smile, defeat someone. And then I went in the temple room, just in time to hear some questions and answers that Srila Prabhupada was fielding after his talk, his arrival talk at the temple. And I got there just in time to hear this one devotee who had been uh, with devotees. Actually, he was a younger brother of Mother Janava, and his name was Jay. And he asked, he had since, since being with the devotees, he had become associated with uh, some born-again Christians. And he asked this question in a challenging mood. He said, so what is this love of God you're feeling? Just sort of out of left field, a real kind of a challenging tone. So, you know, when Prabhupada would answer questions, he would answer more the mode, the intent of the questioner than the, the denotation, the meaning of the question. He would answer the spirit of the, of the asker. So, see what Prabhupada said, what is this love of, love of God that I am feeling? It is that I am not afraid of anything. That's how he chose to answer that, because he was challenging. That's all. A, a boy came who had been uh, one of the top uh, men with uh, Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi. He came to Srila Prabhupada and he announced that uh, Maharishi had sent him to Prabhupada. That he had told Maharishi that he wanted to go higher. And that if he wanted to go higher, Maharishi had responded, if you want to go higher, you must go to Swami Prabhupada. So he had come. So this was, you know, the devotees thought, oh, this is wonderful. What a breakthrough. This is a breakthrough that we're going to, now, this, will, this is a big deal. And so, uh, and it was presented to, Roy was introduced to Prabhupada, and the whole thing was given, said, and the boy uh, said, uh, yes, Maharishi recognizes you as a real thing, and that, he, and so, and so he said, and Maharishi's uh, program is to make people, he said, most people can't follow your path. So to make people a little more qualified to follow your path, Maharishi is helping them just get started. And then they get started, can come to you. He was making this whole presentation like this and probably just listened. He, had a, you know, he was set behind the table, typical fashion. Probably very noncommittal. 
I mean, just listen, everybody was hanging, you know, just waiting to see what he would do. And of course, ourselves being, you know, passionate, we were thinking, this will be an opportunity. We can, you know, it sounds nice, you know, it sounds right. We can get all these people and we can make them devotees. Brother listened. He closed his eyes and when the voice finally finished because he talked for some time, a half hour. Not half hour, but he talked for some time. And uh, so probably closed his eyes. And then he opened his eyes. It is bogus. <laughs> it is bogus. He says, just chant Hare Krishna. There's nothing, no need for anything else. We had one engagement at the University of Buffalo. It was the University of Buffalo and Buffalo State University. So we went there, and Brahmananda Prabhu was there, and there was one priest in the audience, and he was saying that he had practiced silent meditation. So Prabhupada's answer is that silent meditation is not for the sage. Oh, right before the lecture, I remember I was probably was saying he introduced Brahmananda. And he said, this is Brahmananda Das. He's one of my senior members of our movement, one of my, my advanced disciples. So that was my introduction, how to praise the devotees. Although at that time a senior devotee meant that one was in the movement for maybe, you know, two years or one year or three years. You know, but I was saying that Prabhupada was actually praising his disciple in front of all the other, the audience and all the other devotees. I was very impressed by that. And Prabhupada, so Prabhupada was riding in the back, he, in one car, and I was riding in the front in another car. So on the way back, every time the car would pull up and I'd see Srila Prabhupada, I'd pay my obeisances. So I don't know how many hundreds of times I paid my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada on the way back. But when I saw Brahman Andhavaru, he said, yes, and Prabhupada, he saw you kept up paying obeisances, and he was chuckling. <laughs> he thought it was quite amusing. <laughs> Tamal was in charge of this uh, traveling Sankirtan party, and he was a much more effective leader and manager than I was. And yet I was the, the temple president of this small Los Angeles temple, and now it was, it was transitioning into a larger, much larger entity with the, all these... San, San Francisco brahmacharis and a couple of brahmacharinis and all this and so and besides I was working all day and and um, so uh, so Tamal went to Prabhupada for clarification you know well what what's my position and what's the position of the of Dayananda who's the temple president well well Prabhupada he may have told Tamal some things in private. That's, you know, it's, that's not exactly clear to me. But, uh, um, but basically, w the way it was told to me and told to the devotees in general was that well, Dayananda is the temple president. I just remained the temple president. There was no real confusion in in my relationship with Tamal or anything that that I was the temple president. But then Tamal became the secretary. So then, prob so then there was a question. Well, what's the secretary do in Prabhupada said the secretary, you know, is uh, the person who, who relates to the spiritual master. So he kind of, it was a sort of a, a pre-definition to the GBC secretary. And, uh, and then he suggested we have elections. So, he, so Prabhupada nominated some people for, for different posts. One, he, I think he nominated me for temple president, Tamal for secretary, and Jayananda for uh, what was it, vice president, and she, uh, I know that Shilavati was Pujari. I don't know if that, that was an elected position, but the but then I think he, he nominated Birbhadra for temple commander. So I pretty much the devotees voted for everyone who Prabhupada elected, but. But I think we didn't vote, we didn't want Birbhadra as the temple commander because he he was uh, he was about twelve years old or something and and he, the Birbhadra and Girish were under Vishnu John's uh, you know the, he Vishnu John was taking care of him, so so we nominated Vishnu John as the temple commander and I think Vishnu John became the temple commander 
And Madhavisa was the treasurer, that's right. I think Prabhupada nominated Madhavisa as the treasurer, and, and we elected him, and Jayananda vice president, I was president. Tamal was the secretary. So then we had to define, well, what's the secretary? Well, the secretary is the one who, who deals directly with this spiritual master. So I always thought, I didn't probably realize it at the time so much, I had some idea, but later on I realized that uh, Prabhupada was just incredibly skilled at the way he managed the whole situation. I mean, here was this transition, and I remained the president, and even then Tamal left the, the center later and uh, went to, to England and went preaching in various places in the world, but so I, I then was, remained the temple president, and so there was no disturbance. And I thought about it a lot since then, that I see sometimes, that, you know, temple president's not very effective, so let's, here's another guy, he comes in, he's much more effective, and so let's get rid of this old guy and we'll put in the new one, you know. But pr the way Prabhupada did it was so skillful, you know, he just created this new position, <laughs> and he kept the temple president, and there was consistency throughout. We would uh, make resolutions, and then Srila Prabhupada would approve them. So, in fact, sometimes he would attend our meetings. He used to chastise us that why is it taking so long for your meetings?
water out at us, the congregation. And I remember leaping up in the air and catching these droplets of water and thinking of the first uh, Gurvastik, the spiritual masters receiving benediction from the ocean of mercy just as the cloud pours water on the forest fire to extinguish it. So the spiritual master extinguishes the blazing fire of material existence. And remember, this was just like the perfection of that, that shlok, that, um, that stanza. Feeling these drops coming from Srila Prabhupada's lotus hand and then just drinking them. So that was very wonderful. Tamal Krishnamaraj was there. And he, uh, uh, he thought that it would be nice if we had a special ceremony for Bhakti Siddhanta, which Prabhupada, so he said to Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada, the devotees would like to see you do arti to Bhakti Siddhanta. Prabhupada said, Oh, they would like to see? Yes, your brother. Then I will do. So he, uh, he came to, and he did the arti to Bhakti Siddhanta. It was a gorgeous sight to behold. He, uh, the way he offered the paraphernalia was astounding. I mean, I, I'm sure you've probably seen the way he did it, but his, the circles that he made were, it's almost like circling, it was, a, it was like an orbit, it was, it was gorgeous. Every movement was uh, perfectly coordinated. And, uh, but we did, somehow or other, in the setting up the arty tray, people were so beside themselves with the experience of what was happening, that someone had not put a bowl for the, uh, the conch shell water. So he, he uh, I'm standing next to him, I'm holding the arty tray, because that's my job, it's still present. And uh, so he, he did, offers the water, and now it's time to put a little bit into, you know, into a container. And so he looks at me, <laughs> and there's nothing there. So now, of course, everyone's attention is focused on, on Prabhupada. So everyone's, so and everyone's now, what, it's another cri this is a crisis, what to do. And I'm looking around, there's a, there's a sea of devotees. So this, you know, and I'm, <laughs> you know, motioning. To, and so, but to get a, a, you know, something, a container from the kitchen or where, or the Pajari room to come out to the, place of the RT would have taken. But he stood there, he stood. And it was, he wasn't going to let us off, he wasn't going to let me off the hook so easily. It wasn't, you know, because, I mean, conceivably, you could just, you know, go on and do the, you know, do another, another uh, offering. But uh, he wouldn't do that. He stood there. And now it's a crisis, you know. And so then, then when he, then it became apparent that I was not going to be able to solve the, crisis <laughs> quickly and easily he uh, we had a Tulsi on the Vyasa so he took he took the water from the conch and he he just with a flip of his wrist the water just sort of shot from the uh, from the conch shell into the Tulsi plant pot and so, although everyone was having kirtan, the kirtan stopped for just a moment for everyone to go, Haribo! Haribo! <laughs> the intelligence. I remember one time that my mind was wandering. I was, because I was absorbed in type of yoga meditation, and Prabhupada looked at me and said, our process is bhakti, not yoga, not meditation. <laughs> so I was quite, I was like shocked. <laughs> I was quite impressed by how Prabhupada was quite receptive. Even one time Prabhupada was giving at one lecture at the university there. He was talking, he said, in Brahmananda he's told us that these young boys and girls, they take off their clothes and they, they go in with the pigs there. And immediately after hearing this, going to where my mind was at, I became a little disturbed. And then I saw Prabhupada, he saw that some of the devotees were a little disturbed by what he was saying, and immediately changed the subject and went on to something else. So I was, I was noticing how sensitive Prabhupada was when he was talking to people, and how according to their reaction, how Prabhupada would, would speak. Prabhupada was talking to this woman in Iran who was an Indian woman, Mrs. Patel, I think her name was, and she 
she was a wealthy woman from Gujarat, and she uh, she was a Vaishnava, very w wonderful woman. And she and her husband were very nice people, and they were very supportive of us and gave money to the uh, to the movement there in Iran. And um, so uh, she was talking with Prophet in, in his room, and then there was a young man who came. Iran was this popular stop-off place for a lot of sort of world travelers, kind of hippie types, you know, and they would make money and go on. So this young guy, I think he was British or American, so he was kind of a hippie type guy. And so he said to Prabhupada, I mean, he, so he just came in the room, he sat for a while, and Prabhupada was talking to this, this uh, kind of aristocratic Indian woman, and uh, Vaishnava, wealthy Vaishnava woman, and so the guy says, um, but it's, uh, Swamiji, what about, uh, what if I do good for other people? What about just doing good for other people? Can't we just do good for other people? So Prabhupada kind of looked at him and said, what good can you do? You cannot even take care of yourself. <laughs> so I, I was just thinking, you know, by this time, 1976, the movement had progressed to such an extent, you know, and Prabhupada could just say it like it was to these young people, you know, with, with people who are kind of down and out, they think they can do something for others. And, and here, I, I mean, uh, my, my, what I've taken away from that circumstance is that in the beginning Prabhupada had to sort of cultivate, you know, young, irresponsible, hippie-type people, and uh, he was nice to them and encouraged them, but really, what good could they do for the world or for anyone, even for themselves, except to take up Krishna consciousness? And then at the end of the lecture, when Shri Prabhupada was leaving, one girl approached him and said, what is the difference between TM and Krishna consciousness? And Shri Prabhupada said, Krishna consciousness means we chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. That's all he said. So I was realizing that preaching didn't mean that necessarily one had to go into a complete analysis of the person's personality or attack anyone, but one could preach very simply and be very effective at the same time. I remember once we were in the room with him, and someone said, we're discussing God we trust, and they, someone said, uh, Prabhupada, if we take the government, he said, we will make them all, he said, we, will, we will finish all these nonsense religions. The brother said, oh, why? So he, said, <laughs> he, said, he said, we he said, we have no quarrel with these, with these religions, merely we'd like to see that they practice them, that they've actually practiced their religion. That is our only, that, that we would like to see. We were in Prabhupada's garden one time, and, uh, uh, let's see, Nanda Kumar, I think it was Nanda Kumar, it was, it was his servant, and uh, some others were there, and then we, we, we finished, and Prabhupada wanted to go inside, and, uh, and uh, then, uh, we we're walking uh, d behind the temple and into the uh, into Prabhupada's quarters and uh, in the in the lower side uh, there was a one <coughs> there was a uh, main room downstairs from Prabhupada's quarters. I have no idea what it is now used for now. It may be Pujari room now or something. I don't know. But uh, so the this in this room there was a, there were some cupboards and some of the Krishna book paintings had been put in one of the cupboards they were sort of sticking out they were too large for this cupboard and there were several of them sitting on the floor right there maybe leaning against the wall so Prabhupada noticed that here here were the Krishna book paintings just sort of st stacked up there and not very nicely protected or something and so Prabhupada said well he said you know why are these here who, who, who uh, something. What what are these doing here? So, Nandi Kumar or whoever was his servant said, uh, 
So I don't know, Prabhu, it's not my responsibility. And that was pretty direct, you know, that was a pretty wide open hit there. I mean, for, for somebody to say something like that, Prabhu just shot back. It is to your responsibility. So that's always, I always remember that because that was a pretty clear um, indication that, you know, we have to take responsibility for things. And, and he, he expected his disciples to take responsibility for things that they saw in, in, the, uh, in his movement. That at some time during one of those lectures, Srila Prabhupada told us, frankly, that we had all come to him, to Krishna, because of prasadam. He just told us flat out, we were all prasadam bhaktas. <laughs> so Prabhupada, when he, Prabhupada said that, he was being fanned by Abhi Ram Prabhu, who was the temple president. And uh, Abhi Ram is, is, is very reserved. He doesn't uh, just open his mind to anybody. He's a very cool customer. And, uh, but when Prabhupada said we were all prasanam devotees, he looked at Abhi Ram and said, You too, Abhi Ram? So, so Abhi Ram was who would became very sheepish, just out of character completely, and said, Yes, Srila Prabhupada, me too. <laughs> and when he said, Me too, Srila Prabhupada said, Jai. And his, when he said Jai, his head just wheeled slowly, like the sun rising. And it, as his head wheeled, his, his smile kind of got bigger and bigger until it, it was like ear to ear, Jai. And he just, his head, all across us, and his, his head wheeled across us. It was like we went, Jai. <laughs> It was so funny. And one time, Satsuruta Maharaj was going over some of the different devotees who lived at the temple. And then Prabhupada said, and asking him, you know, telling him what they were doing. And Prabhupada said, devotee? Well, devotee means they're first class. If they're a devotee, then they're first class. In other words, rather than analyzing the different personalities, Prabhupada just said, oh, they're a devotee, they're first class. So I just sort of on a whim wrote this year, well, maybe I'll also run for mayor. Like Amarinder had done, and just a sort of a because as I said, we got to, we used to be able to write this little problem. So it came. I wrote this in one line. It came back the letter from him. The whole letter was all was you know encouraging me to do this. Um, most of the whatever else I had mentioned was he he responded, but not very much. He went on about we must set the perfect example in all fields of life. Why not politics? So, but so now, he has become his response. If I took, if I made one suggestion of maybe equivalent of a one, his response was a hundred, and uh, so now I'm stuck because, I, because Sri Prabhupada, you know, wants me to do this. So we corresponded a number of times, and and he told me what to say, and so I, I ran for office, and it was a wonderful experience. It was. Uh, it's like in, with Amrinda, we were able to present these, we were able to debate these fellows in public. He told me to concentrate, he told, he, he told me to concentrate on the spiritual side of the issues, that not to get too much into all the details of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the issues that, that were in the election, but to, if we, but we can give them Krishna consciousness. So that's what we did. So basically, I just it was like a Bhagavatam class, and uh, he said like he said he said you know they uh, they've come here thinking that they'll solve all their problems here. This is like a this this place is like a prison house or a hospital, and these people are like the sons of very wealthy man, of a very wealthy man, who have come to the prison house by misfortune. And somehow they've gotten the idea that they will make a solution of all their problems in the prison house. So, but they will never find happiness in the prison house. They've forgotten their position as the sons of very wealthy men. So this should be remembered. This is the sum and substance of the purpose of human life. They speak like this, so you know. Basically, we did that, and uh, so it was. 
we didn't get so many votes. So I wrote to him. So after the election was over, I wrote to him. Uh, I said, that, you know, we didn't get so many votes. And he wrote back, it doesn't matter, you have not gotten many votes. He said, I have seen that you have not compromised our philosophy. Uh, my spiritual master also never compromised. So you have not compromised. Krishna will note, Krishna will note what you have done to try to make them Krishna conscious. And I am proud of you. So go on in this way. And there, there is no failure for the devotee. So it was very, I was a little discouraged perhaps from not getting as good a response as what we had hoped from the public. So he was, he was encouraging us. One time Prabhupada, for years Prabhupada uh, treated me, I would say, pretty much like a householder because most of my career I kind of came as a householder, as boyfriend, girlfriend, and we were married right there in the beginning. And then, so he treated me qu quite a bit as a householder, and, which I think is a little different than Brahmachari Sannyas. And uh, obviously I was his disciple, but he, he treated me a little bit uh, not so strictly a little, little bit more lenient than Brahmachari Sanyas. So then uh, I came to Mayapur in 1976 to learn Sanskrit. I had already learned a little bit and uh, I was teaching the Gurukula and also the, uh, I wanted to, to, anyway, get a little further advanced. Uh, so. Uh, so I was reading some uh, Baladev Vidyavushan's commentary on the Gita, studying that and working with another Indian devotee. And uh, so I thought, this is bona fide, you know, it's Baladev's commentary, it's uh, in the line, Prabhupada bases his commentary on, on that commentary and, and other things. So, so then the Prabhupada asked me what I was doing, I told him in the morning walk that this is what I was doing. Is reading this Baldev's commentary and then studying something else, a grammar, Gita grammar. So then in the evening, uh, Prabhupada said, you know, okay, we'll talk about it later. And I think you wanted time to think about it or something. So then in the evening, I came in and I sat down in the, and there's a darshan. We, Prabhupada would have at four o'clock or so. And uh, several people were there in the room and Prabhupada was talking with somebody and then this conversation sort of stopped and then he turned, he looked at me and he just shot at me and he said, why are you going over the head of the spiritual master? And he was, just treated me very s strongly. And uh, at that time there was a general tendency among the Sanskrit pe people who were into Sanskrit, there were a few of us, four, five, six of us who were getting into Sanskrit and one person was into Gopi, uh, Goswami things, not Gopi, but I mean Goswami writings and uh, some Leela kind of things and I was doing this, another was whatever. So there was a kind of a tendency to uh, deviate I think from, uh, Prabhupada felt that there was a, uh, the, this direction he wasn't uh, so pleased about. So that's, it's a whole story but uh, there was a change in, uh, I felt, in relationship in there it, that Prabhupada really sort of pulled me down to earth and said, you know, look, you, this is a deviation. He really then, so I became Prabhupada's secretary for a month after that, and during that time he treated me very strictly, and uh, a couple times I made a couple little mistakes, things that I considered minor, but he really took me to task on these things. And after I'd been temple presidents in several places, I thought, surely I'm, you know, I've achieved a certain level of responsibility and that kind of thing. But then I was a secretary and, and I made mistakes in what I thought were minor areas, but uh, Prabhupada uh, really took me to task and treated me very strictly. And uh, so this is also, in a sense, a kind of compassion. I mean, it shows compassion, it shows relationship, it shows different kinds of treatment according to different uh, people, according to different uh, circumstances. 
Prabhupada was incredibly uh, flexible in the way he would train and, and relate to people. Srila Prabhupada stayed, he, he stayed longer than a week there. He stayed a week to ten days in June 76. And uh, it was the time when he uh, you know, cleaned up the, the Sahaja tendency that some devotees were getting into with, because the, the CC had come out recently, the so-called Gopi Bhava Club. And Prabhupada came down very heavy on it. I wasn't in on those meetings because I wasn't part of the club. I did go to one meeting. I was invited and uh, I knew something was wrong because the Bhagavad Gita was being minimized as just dealing with the modes of material nature. Prabhu, you know, it's just it's for neophytes. So anyway, Prabhupada did come down heavy on, on the devotees there. And it's what they needed, what we all needed to hear. The first uh, full-blown Western, you know, Sahaja weed was growing around the Bhakti Lata. So uh, Prabhupada came down very heavy. I wasn't there, so I can't say firsthand, but there were many famous quotes that came out of that, devotees even asking, but Prabhupada, you say everything is in your books, you know, that's there too, this intimate Leela. So I said, yes, my books are like a drugstore, I heard Prabhupada say. But it's not that when you walk in the drugstore, you, you just buy any medicine, you have to get the medicine that's appropriate for you. First Kurukshetra Leela, then Rasa Leela. First deserve, then desire. That was another answer Prabhupada gave to one of their, their questions. Even challenges, I heard. So, um, so Sri the Prophet was so sweet, but so heavy, you know, hard as a thunderbolt, soft as a rose. So because he's like that, and I'm even working on the books, I'm the indexer for the, the books, and I'm working on the eighth cano as he's there translating and dictating, and there's... Because he's so heavy, I'm thinking, I have these mixed feelings in my consciousness, I'm thinking, Boy, Srila Prabhupada's been here a week. This is great. I wonder when he's going to leave. Because <laughs> it was so heavy, you know, just to be, I wasn't even living with him. I wasn't his servant, personal. I was just living in the same neighborhood where Prabhupada was staying. You know, he was in his quarters and, and we need to work at each down there. And I'm thinking, this is intense. I don't know how long I can go on, you know, being in the same neighborhood as Prabhupada. He was so heavy, you know. So that was another... Uh, you know, indication that I had a long way to go before I could be intimate with, with Prabhupada. So one time I wrote him a letter and I asked him some questions and he would send me back a one-page letter on preaching, which I was quite surprised about. I had asked him, I, the only the question I had asked him that time is, is how does bhava turn into prema? Because I was one of these devotees who felt that they were much more advanced than they actually were. Uh, we had this, the only, we had the nectar of devotion, it was a Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Ban Maharaj. So Srila Prabhupada told Rupanuga Prabhu that he could only read the purports, but he shouldn't read the translations. Because the purports were all by Srila Jiva Goswami, most of them, or Vishnu Chakravati Thakur. So, although Rupanuga didn't like it so much that I was reading it, but I'd stay up at night and read it secretly, I thought that that would give me some special realizations. So I was reading the part about bhava, and I was convinced after some time that I was already on the stage of bhava. That was just a qu question of time, but I, it turned into prema. So I asked Srila Prabhupada about how bhava would turn into prema. So Srila Prabhupada wrote me back. He said, he said uh, I've heard that you're all going out in Buffalo. I said, this is very good. You should all go out. And, and chant Hare Krishna everywhere all around Buffalo and distribute as many Bhagavad Gita's and preach about Bhagavad Gita as possible. And then he said, the boys and the girls in your country are generally good souls. That's why they've taken birth in such a nice country. He said, just like here in, in San Francisco, this, we've just had Rathiyatra and 10,000 boys and girls were dancing and chanting in full transcendental ecstasy. I've heard that in Buffalo, in New York, in just two weeks, they've distributed 3,000 back to Godheads. And then in Buffalo, you're also distributing back to Godhead very nicely. Please continue in this way, and your success in life is assured. As Krishna sees that you're working seriously to bring his other children back to the spiritual kingdom, then he'll bestow all his blessings upon you. That Krishna is never ungrateful for our efforts to serve him, rest assured. And regarding your question, 
how bhava turns into prema, there's no need to trouble yourself over such advanced questions at the present time. Shortly, we'll be, I'll be uh, publishing my book, Nectar Devotion, and that will explain about it there. And as far as the $50 you sent me, I, see, I find no enclosed money in the check, Do you know, in this letter. Do you know where it is? <laughs> so at once I realized that Prophet was quite sensitive. <laughs> then instead of giving me an answer to the question, he was telling me what the actual answer to the question was. Not the, que that, not the answer that I thought. But if I actually wanted these advanced stages of Krishna consciousness, the method was going out and distributing Prabhupada's books and chanting Hare Krishna on the street. And that would gradually give me the answers to the question I wanted. Then the last thing was that uh, Rupanuga wrote to him about... Rupanuga wrote to Prabhupada asking permission for himself to go to law school. And then he just put in that I, he also got permission for me, although I had not asked Rupanuga to do that. And it was, it had a lot of other people listed that were all going to go to law school. There's a whole list of people who were all going to go to law school. So Amrinder had gone, and Rupanu was going to go, and I was going to go, and a bunch of other people. So it's probably wrote back, um, yes, you may go, but not that all of our men should become lawyers. <laughs> he said, but in Balavanta's case, I can understand that he wants to use this for political preaching. So in that way, it's all right. But other, not that all, not that everyone should become a lawyer. And he said, I've always wanted a lawyer on the GBC. That's what he, that was the basis for Rupanuga's permission. I've always wanted a lawyer on the GBC. So in 1969, uh, Gargamuni started the incense business there, and and he convinced me to uh, quit my job and go to work in the incense full time. So I shaved up, and then pro I walked into that little room, you know, I was describing, and. Walked in there and probably looked and said, Oh, you have become Brahmachari. He was surprised to see that I'd shaved. And, and then uh, later, I think he told, uh, he told, uh, well, I know much later even, he, he mentioned to Jayatirtha that uh, he didn't think that was such a good idea that uh, I'd quit my job. And he thought it was just as well that I'd remain as a uh, professional rather than going in the incense. Uh, business. And then uh, he mentioned to me once later in Watsika, I came to see him for a morning walk once and I was in the dhoti and shaved head and, and which I had been doing for some months then. And he said, uh, told me some story about, and I still, ca to this day I can't understand the meaning. It could mean either that I wear a dhoti or I wear a suit, actually. It didn't, he didn't say mm -hmm. either way, but he was talking about sticking to your guns, kind of. And he told me this story about uh, in, in British India, there, were the, there was this office, and the, in charge of the office, there were a couple of British uh, uh, overseers, and they had a lot of clerks in the office. And so this is obviously in Calcutta or in the, those days of uh, anyway, so the the uh, these overseers said that the, these two uh, they, they said that the overseers announced that uh, no one should wear tilak in the office. So then the next day, you know, no one wore tilak except for two men. So then the, these British overseers and they called the. Uh, office to attention or something and they stood up and they said you know you two men you come up here and then they had the men stand up in front of everyone and they said okay these men are the real devotees the real Vaishnavas you know you people are all just something imitation so so Prabhupada told the story and he was but it was in re it was in regard to my uh, wearing a, a, a coat and trousers and or a dhoti or something. It was this one morning, even though it was several months after I had stopped wearing a, a coat and trousers and going to work, he was kind of saying, "You have to stick to your guns." The prophet arrived at the airport, and remember, everyone had lined up to see the prophet. It was a little bit more, too much of a, more or less a riot. 
the devotees ran through the airport and they were all chanting and screaming. Prabhupada was actually quite disappointed. He didn't like the fact that the devotees were disrespectful on his arrival to the people in the airport. And he, he seemed very, very grave. He didn't appreciate that. But in any case, we arrived back. It was at Kesha Bharti Guru's house. He was a householder at that time, and he, he gave his house for Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada came upstairs, and then they, we performed the Abhishek to Srila Prabhupada. And I remember I was fanning Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada became very, very compassionate. And he started to say, he said, these people, they're very unhappy. He said, we simply want that they become happy. And with those words and Prabhupada's compassion, I, it summed up the whole mission for me of Krishna consciousness, is to make these unhappy people happy. Then at the end, Prabhupada was sitting there, and he, uh, Tamil Krishna Maharaj and Vishnu Jan Maharaj were relating their pastimes at Berkeley, preaching to the students there. And they had said to Srila Prabhupada, he said, yes, we were, we had one uh, problem from the vendors there, because we were giving out free prasadam to the people there. And they became envious, and they filed a petition to the police chief, saying that these people are giving, you know, they're creating disturbance by giving out, without a license, so much food. So then we got a petition from all the students, and we presented it. So many thousands and thousands of students had signed up asking for, a free, you know, for our food. And we presented it to the police chief and said, so who is better? These thousands of signatures or these few signatures, the, the vendors? And the police chief had to admit that these few, sign, uh, these few signatures were not as good as these thousands and thousands of signatures. So he said, that is all right. And then he said that these vendors became very envious and they attacked us. And Vishnu Jan Maharaj and Tamil Krishna Maharaj they took their dandas and defended the devotees. And Prabhupada thought for a few minutes, very thoughtfully, and he said, yes, wherever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement is, there will be victory. And the devotees went, Jai, Srila Prabhupada. And Jai Nandapuru walked in. He was working on the Rathyatra carts, and he fell asleep in the back there. And the devotees started to, to disturb him. And Prabhupada said, no, stop. He's doing more work than all of you. And at the end, when we were leaving, probably they, they brought in this huge bowl of fruit, fruit for Srila Prabhupada. And I thought, wow, we're going to have a big feast now. And Srila Prabhupada started to take prasadam, the fruit, different things, and offer it to the devotees. And he gave me a strawberry. And he looked at me and said, don't eat very much at night. <laughs> In the airport, uh, everyone in the airport, I'm not exaggerating, their consciousness was on Sri Prabhupada. I mean, he commanded that much attention. This was a busy metropolitan airport. And uh, the way he walked, you know, was, with his head, was so regal that people deferred to him. All the air, I mean, people, it was, you know, it was, here was obviously a very, important person. It's almost as though when the lion goes through the jungle, the other animals, you know, they make way. And so people, people made way, and he was perfectly comfortable under those circumstances. Um, so he had his cane, and we had a room, VIP room, which they provided for us. We made a Vyasa son. He, uh, he, it wasn't much of a Vyasa son. As a matter of fact, it was a, it was a, it was a cushion with some legs on it we had made very hurriedly. And we placed, we placed the, this asana on top of a table. <laughs> I mean, we have to remember, we were 22 years old, you know, and we were coming out of you know, the most, you know, unregulated lifestyle. So you know, <laughs> everything was a daze for us. And we were all young. There wasn't an older person amongst us. And so we, put, we got this, but we figured it had to be high. And there were chairs for everyone else. So we put this asana, asana on the table. And uh, so Prabhupada, he was, even amongst such unqualified people, to me now, a 22-year-old is another generation. You, you, you treat them really as your children to give them guidance. Of course, as they get 16, they're treated as equals. Nonetheless, they're young adults who need guidance. In his case, he was only to be our grandfather. 
And yet, he was allowing us. Of course, he wasn't really allowing us. He was allowing Krishna. He he was completely in Krishna's hands. But we were the the what people Krishna had sent somehow. So wherever we told him, go here, he would go. Okay, where do we go now? Go here. So we go in this room and we take him up and we and we walk up to the table. <laughs> and, and so he's, it's, that's, that's the stopping point. There's a table. So uh, he doesn't... So we say to him, this is your seat. <laughs> and he looks at us and he, you know, he, with this question, you know, and we say, oh, it's, it's sturdy, she <laughs> And uh, you could see he was... You know, you know, it was against this better judgment, perhaps. I don't want to, you know, I can't understand the mind of the Acharya, but in any case, he, he, uh, he, we put, had a, a little step for him, and he climbed up on this table and sat on the asana. He was just very charitable to us. I mean, he just, you know, rather than, rather than hurt our feelings, he would do something which, you know, a, a gentleman of his age to walk on top of a table and sit on this, you know, wooden asana with a cushion on it. But because we had done it for him, and because we were trying in our uh, immature way to honor him, he accepted it. I mean, it, what, something that, that a materialistic gentleman you know, would have just said, this is not right. Take, take, get this out of here. Uh, don't you have something uh, that's a more... Don't, don't mind. I'll sit on the chair and the other person, oh, don't be so foolish. But it never it was not nothing of that nature in him. It was just it was an ex, it was a loving exchange. And then he decided at that time. This is 1970, end of 70, I guess 70, beginning of 71, to go to, back to India. So I remember sitting in Prabhupada's garden in Los Angeles, and Rupanuga was visiting there. Karandar was there, of course. And maybe one other, I don't know, Bhagawan, I don't know for sure, but I, th I know that Rupanuga was there and, and Karanda and I. So Prabhupada was saying that, uh, shall I go to India? He says, I, I'm thinking to go to India and take a, a group of devotees with me to India. Well, it turned out that he took quite a few devotees and many, some devotees went with him to Japan and then came back and but, and he took quite a lot of money. I remember we, in Los Angeles, we gave him. Our temple was practically cut by half in Los Angeles. And we, we were amazed. Karandar and I were amazed. It was like a cell. It was like a cell splitting in half. And then we cut ourselves in half and then we grew. It was just an incredible experience. And money, we gave Prabhupada several thousand dollars. And then we just, you know, managed somehow. And... It was just an amazing experience to, to have that kind of growth and to experience that, uh, that time. And so in the garden that, um, that time, we, we were all experiencing, I think, a lot of pressure and a lot of change. Uh, and I think these things particularly affect me. I, I certainly am affected by change. And, um, so Prabhupada said to the other devotees, to each devotee, Rupanuga, and, and Rupanuga, I was always impressed with, seemed to be very, uh, he has a very mature presence with Prabhupada, and he seemed to be able to communicate well with Prabhupada, and I always felt myself in awe of Prabhupada, and, and, then, and I was a little impressed that Rupanuga could communicate so easily with him. So Prabhupada asked Rupanuga, should I go to India? And I'm not sure about this, but... It was either Rupanuga or one of the others said he was not much in favor of Prabhupada going to India. So he expressed that opinion. And then another once kind of supported it. I don't know if it was Karanda or not. But then Prabhupada asked me, he said, Dayananda, what do you think I should do? And I was just like, I'd never given Prabhupada advice on such monumental thing. You know, he asked me, did I think that the showers would work? You know, and I was like, yeah, you know, I think we can fix the showers, Prabhupada. But should I go to India, you know, and talking about taking a big party of devotees and all this, you know, it was just like completely beyond my, uh, 
realm, I felt. And so I just said, you know, something diplomatic. I said, Prabhupada, I think you should do whatever is your desire. And Prabhupada just shot back at me. He says, my desire is to spread this Sankirtan movement all over the world. And I just I kind of, you know, entered my heart, you know. And it's like, you know, like, oh, that's right. I, how could I be so stupid as to not have, you know, be sort of grounded in that idea. But I think that had a tr lot of, just, you know, having been uh, told that was like a, a very strong uh, influence. Strong, you know, something. Because it was the right time and the right place for, to be influenced by Prabhupada in that way. It was, it was something that I think about regularly. <laughs> the deities, they, somehow or another, one of the Madhajis, Nanda Kumara's wife, she had stripped the paint off the deities and was going to repaint them. And Prabhupada said, who told you to do this? And she said, well, I talked to Bhadraj. He said, Bhadraj? Who's Bhadraj? <laughs> he said, but, and then she was shaking and he said, who's Bhadraj? He said, I'm your spiritual master. I'm right here. Why didn't you ask me? And she was shaking. She, she ran out of the room crying. And then, you know, it was like doubtful whether they were going to install Radhakala Chandra. And then they found, then they discovered they can get some quick drying paint. So then they painted the deities and, and she probably did the, the installation. And I was amazed how expertly Prabhupada was like directing everyone. And then Prabhupada was, did the RT after he personally did the installation, the sacrifice. And then he did the RT to the deities. And the whole room was so blissful. Uh, Shishi Radhakala Chandri and, and Srila Prabhupada were giving so much mercy. The whole, the whole room became just like Vaikuntha. And somehow the devotees uh, who did the puppet show, Vishnu John and others, they had this story about uh, Narada Muni. And there's a story of Narada Muni. I even saw the same story, I think, in the As It Is magazine. But uh, there's a story of Narada Muni. Uh, he, he's w with Krishna, and he asked Krishna, well, what's Maya? And then all of a sudden, you know, Narada Muni's in the desert, and he gets married and meets somebody, and he has a family and the family gets washed away in the flood and the, and the, uh, and the uh, he calls out you know Krishna my family and then all of a sudden he's back with Krishna because oh Krishna asked him for a glass of water or something he goes off and he falls into Maya and he gets in this family and the family is in the, disappears in the flood and all this and so it turns out that this is not a bona fide story <laughs> So they did a puppet show on this story, and, and uh, Prabhupada didn't like it, you know, because he said, what story is that? You know, you, they were practicing the puppet show in the parking lot, and that's outside of Prabhupada's quarters. And uh, Prabhupada's looking out the window and saw him practicing. Said, what story are they doing? <laughs> and they told him, oh, you know, Prabhupada, that one about Narada Muni when he falls into Maya. <laughs> Narada Muni doesn't fall into Maya. <laughs> So that was a kind of a nice anecdote, I guess. That, you know, Prabhupada checked the. And he was always sort of supervising things and checking to see that things were being done in a bona fide way. We put on a play. I didn't put on the, the devotees put on a play. A very nice play. Uh, he liked this play very much. It was. Uh, he made very clear his pleasure at this play. It was. Uh, Leela, it was Chaitanya Leela, and he had told he told how when he was uh, young he had been in a play of Lord Chaitanya Leela, and when the play was get, they had to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it for years, and when they put on the play, everyone at the end of the play everyone in the audience was crying. And he said, I don't, I did not know why they were crying. He said, uh, the play should be on this standard. But we put on the play of the Kazi, Lord Chaitanya and the Kazi. And uh, he, he liked it very much. He laughed. 
and when they uh, uh, they said one of the one of the Mahan, one of the one of the Brahmins said, uh, if we give the holy name to the common people, it will expand. It will be too, too expanded. And Prabhupada laughed and he said, it is already expanded. It is already expanded. It cannot be stopped. Um, and so uh, another thing was that he participated, in the play? he participated in the play. Yeah, he would interrupt. He'd interrupt the play and make statements. Um, uh, then, yeah, we had a broken mridanga. That one of those clay mridangas that was broken beyond repair. So we sort of repaired it with uh, plaster of Paris. And then at one point in the play, <laughs> for, dra for drama, when the Kazi's men came to stop the kirtan, we, one of the Kazi's men picked the mridanga up and threw it on the ground. <laughs> his eyes got big. It was like you know, a great offense. And the, so I was near the Vyasa son, so I whispered, it's already broken, probably. It's already broken. But I don't think, I don't think that placated him too much. I mean, he didn't get angry, but uh, we would never do that again. <laughs> we had a play, and uh, this was, the play was in the separate room. It wasn't in the temple room. It was in the Brahmachari room. So it was after the sort of the program, and we had this play. No, no, it was a puppet show. Vishnu John uh, made these puppets, and uh, it was a Prahlad puppet show. So behind the puppet uh, screen, there was a, uh, Shilavati was Prahlad's mother, and and Vishnu John, and maybe one or two other devotees were there doing the different puppets and. So at one point, you know, Rani Kashipu is going to feed Prahlad the, uh, some, uh, some poison food. So, so then there's this, uh, uh, this plate of prashadam, some sweets. Were, it was put on, the, uh, on this uh, puppet uh, stage. Then, uh, so Prahlad is offering to the spiritual master. So, he, so, so then... Uh, uh, then one of the devotees, one of the brahmacharis is told, you know, Jai Gopal, bring the sweets to uh, the spiritual master. So then they take the sweets and offer it to Prabhupada, you know, actually go and take. So Prabhupada says, oh, you're trying to poison me? <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Rawan made this joke and everybody just <laughs> had such a kick out of it. <laughs> I had the opportunity to talk with him a little bit about the play. He said, yes, this play is so nice. There should be more plays on this standard. Uh, uh, the devotees had worked very hard for this year, probably they did many rehearsals. He said, yes, whatever you do sincerely for Krishna will be a success. When Srila Prabhupada made it to Chicago for Rathayatra, and... The first impression I remember is when we greeted, Srila Prabhupada came in early in the morning, around 6, 6.30, so we had Guru Puja for him. And I remember it was ecstatic chanting and dancing. But there was one devotee, I think it might have been Mahabudi Prabhu. Uh, he was dancing kind of like, he was sort of like doing the twist. Or some, you know, so he, was, he was boogieing somehow. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada, without, I don't think he singled him out, I forget if he did or he didn't. But he stopped the kirtan. Srila Prabhupada stopped this ecstatic kirtan. And he pointed to a picture of Lord Chaitanya with his arms upraised. He said, dance like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So he, did, he, you know, he would encourage anybody, with however they were dancing. But uh, you know, he wanted, in this case, the devotee to come to a higher platform. <laughs> dance like Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I remember one time he was giving darshan or this is before class, all oh, the Gurukul students were reciting different verses. And they were all citing uh, the Bhagavad Gita. There was one little devotee named uh, Smarana, Krishna Smarana. He had a very good memory. I, I was also mem memorizing the Bhagavad Gita, although I wasn't part of the temple, because if you knew the whole chapter of the Bhagavad Gita or the chapters that they had studied, then they'd give you a whole maha plate. 
So I was trying to keep up with the Gurukul students so I could get a Maha plate also when I visited there. So Krishna uh, Smaranam, or maybe it was Leela Smaranam, I can't remember the little boy's name, he was expert at reciting, so he recited so many verses from the Bhagavad Gita. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. But probably looked at him and said, so what is the translation? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, no, this is useless. They must know the translation. <laughs> So then I realized, yeah, I also have to know what it means. <laughs> it's not enough to be able to be to parrot the words. One interesting thing was I was very tired because we had been up 24 hours, and uh, so I think on the, he was there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and he left on Monday, I believe. So on one of those mornings, I guess it was Sunday morning, I had uh, I, did, I missed Mangalarti. I usually don't, but I was tired. And so I didn't get up for Mong Arthur. So uh, it, we, we, there was a small group of devotees in his room, and he said, uh, "He said one thing is uh, the devotees here do not go to Mongol Arti. and there had been a huge Mongol Arti. So, so I, I said, "Oh yes, probably they go to Mongol Arti. They had Mongol Arti. He says, "Hmm." <laughs> We then toured the building. When, when the uh, realtor came, we toured that building. We went to the other building. We looked around, and, and we kind of just, I don't know if we decided at that moment that we wanted the Watseka building. But, but then Prabhupada said to the, uh, to the minister, the minister was the only representative of the church. He says, Prabhupada says to him, uh, he says, so he says, he says, you are serving God, and we are serving God. He said, so we are both servants of God. And he said, in some ways, you know, we are just as poor as church mice, as, as they say. So I'm really paraphrasing this. And, but, so, so Prabhupada is saying, you know, we're just as poor as church mice, and you're a servant of God, we're a servant of God. So he said, so in some sense, we could just ask you to give it to us, for service of God. He said, but we're, we won't ask you that. He said, but you give us your best price. <laughs> the prophet was just, he obviously wanted it. He's negotiating with him like anything. I mean, you know, in some sense he was really, you know, kind of pushing him. We went to morning walk at a uh, park which was at the base of the Atlanta skyline. It's, it's like a Central Park in New York in the sense that it's close into the city. Atlanta skyline has become since then actually quite impressive. But at the time it was growing and you know, Atlanta was a up-and-coming city and, and they, were, they were and they still are really into being, you know, trying to become the next great city and very urbanized. And they're totally immersed in this consciousness. So, we walked, and Prabhupada looked at me, because I was the temple president there, so he was speaking to me. And he, uh, he pointed to the this, to this skyscrapers, and he said, Do not be impressed. He said, Do not be impressed. He said, Krishna, can, Krishna will finish it in a moment. At one time he said that, uh, he said, Margin, these people are so foolish that they don't know that sometimes in Margin they put some kind of, uh, I forget the name of the chemical. He said, but this is actually just stool, potassium phosphate. He said, sometimes they get this from stool, and they, and they think Margin is better than butter. He said, people are so foolish. Prabhupada left Los Angeles, he went to Russia. So he came back to uh, Los Angeles. This was still in 1970, and uh, he started talking about Russia. And then he said, I remember one time we were in the garden, and he said, his first impression of Russian people, they said they were very, he said the man was very strong. He picked up the luggage, and he was talking about how it was unnecessary to have, you know, to have so much strength. He was a little critical of, of such strength physical strength and 
because, uh, of course, we, our intention is not to be muscle-bound, but to be a more spiritually inclined. So I remember in the garden he was talking about how this man was strong and picking up their luggage. And then he commented on the, uh, the women, the, he said that women were very uh, big also, and, and uh, he was saying how the gopis were uh, tribhanga lalita, like he said that tribhanga means that they have sort of three angles or something like that, They're, meaning that they had a figure and the gopis uh, were attractive, and that these, but these uh, Russian women that he was commenting, uh, he wasn't... Uh, so that was sort of a first impression about Russia. It was, seemed a little formidable at that time. This was an era when the book distributors and the devotees who stayed at the temple to do temple services were in some degree of tension. And the book distributors sometimes, would, independent of the, the, the voice of state at the temple, would sort of exaggerate their position to some degree. For example, sometimes they would say that only the book distributors are the gopis and everyone else. Uh, these things would be said. And it would cause, it, it caused anxiety in various devotees. But there were the quotes where Prabhupada said, you know, if you want the best thing, go distribute my books and so on. So a lot of these book distributors were at the temple for Prabhupada's visit. So after the Sunday feast, there became a time for questions. One devotee raised his hand, he was obviously a book distributor, and he said, Prabhupada, he just apparently had the mind that he would resolve this dispute once and for all from Shiva Prabhupada's own lips, and that would be a definitive answer. And uh, so he raised his hand and he said, Shiva Prabhupada, what pleases you the most? So everybody goes, oh boy. <laughs> so, uh, great anticipation of what would come. Prabhupada, without a very quick, immediate response, when you love Krishna. And, Haribo! It was a very pleasing answer. So the last time I saw Srila Prabhupada was in Los Angeles, and I was working at the BBT, making the indexes for his books. He was sending the eighth canto through production, eighth and ninth. Working on the eighth, that's right, because there was some purport in the eighth canto where Srila Prabhupada is talking about the days of the week and why are they in the order they're in. And it has to do with the planets, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So Srila Prabhupada said, I'm simply traveling all over the world. He just come from Hawaii, Fiji, whatever. And I'm asking this question, why are the days of the week in the order they're in? So he was asking us, too. So why is Sunday the first day? So Srila Prabhupada, or some devotee piped up and said, because it is the Lord's Day. And Srila Prabhupada said, don't bring in religion. Because he wanted to put everything on a scientific basis. And nobody accepts religion in this day and age. It's just all sectarian and sentimental. So that was very significant. That Srila Prabhupada wanted to set this scientific basis of the days of the week. And so he started talking about the order of the planets. The sun is closest, then the moon. Controversial point. <laughs> Mars, Mercury, or etc. Jupiter. Venus, or whatever, whatever the order is, Saturn. So, um, uh, and then I remember a couple of morning walks, nice morning walks in the park near Santa Monica, in Santa Monica somewhere. And it was around six o'clock in the morning, the sun was just rising and was coming through the trees, and Hari Shari Prabhu was taping. And uh, I remember this one thing how there was this little old lady in the park saw us coming one morning, this whole um, squadron of saffron moving toward her. And uh, we all were coming toward her, and I was wondering, what's Srila Prabhupada going to see? I know he seemed like he was going to say something. What's Srila Prabhupada going to say? So what Srila Prabhupada was said was, he didn't say Hare Krishna, or he just said, in the most gracious way, he said, Good morning, in a very, with very long, gracious tones. 
And the lady kind of gave this nice return, the greeting, and, and she gave a look like, this is, the most, this is the most wonderful thing I've ever seen. So Srila Prabhupada knew just what to say at the right time. So he, co he came in the temple room, and he took his seat on the Vyasan, which had just, everything was fresh. I mean, it was a brand new, people had worked literally, you know, 24 hours for a week. In fact, probably commented when he got to his room, wherever I go, there's always a smell of fresh paint. <laughs> but then he laughed. But so he, gets, he goes into his Vyasasan, and everyone gets in the temple room, it takes a few minutes, and it's almost hushed. And they sit down, and the devotees, I mean, it's, it's standing room only, but somehow most of the devotees are in the temple room and there's some large doors so they can kind of spill out in the hallways onto the porch. And it's a, sort of, it's, it's a silence. I think probably at that point chanted uh, Paramakaruna for the first time. Pahunduijana Nitai Gora Chanda. And he chanted it every time he came to the temple room during that visit. After the chant, he gave his opening address and uh, first of all, he got everybody totally ecstatic by saying, he said, I, on my tour, I have been, and he said, Los Angeles, I think Mexico City, Caracas, Miami. And uh, he said, and now I've come to Atlanta, and I see your temple is the best. <laughs> everybody, that was a start. But then, probably, you know, more importantly than that, Sri Prabhupada began to address, he gave his opening address, and he said, um, Radha and Krishna, the Krishna came and he demanded surrender. Lord Chaitanya does not make such demand. He simply distributes love of God to everyone. So as he began this, this this lecture, this address, the devotees, I think all of us, settled to, down to hear uh, Prabhupada's spe speaking, and we expect we had heard this concept before. But <clears throat> of course, we were everyone was hanging on every word, but we didn't expect what was to take place after that. He was speaking in a normal voice, uh, and then. He stopped, and uh, there was silence. And you could see the tear. His eyes were closed, and the tears were coming from his eyes. And it was like a uh, uh, if you turn on a faucet and you try to hold your hand to keep the water in, but the pressure is such that you can't, and the water leaks out. It was like the pressure of his eyes. It was almost as though. If he were to open his eyes, they would shoot, like you see described in the Chaitanya Chaitanya. But then, he opened his mouth to speak, to go on speaking. The words wouldn't come out. You could see that you know the emotion within was like a volcano. It was like, you know, almost shaking. You could see that the body was filling with emotion. And he tried three or four times to go on with his speaking, and he just couldn't. So then, and, and no one knew what to do. Uh, and we did not, you know, no one. What, what? What is the etiquette? It's like he just he didn't know whether you should get up, you know, or whether you should begin chanting, or you should just be quiet, because it was a very int here it was an intimate thing, and yet we're in a public room with all these people, and so uh, you could see him struggling within to go on, and finally he was able to speak, but he couldn't. But his voice it was like it barely came out. And when it did, it was very high. His voice was very high because it was a struggle to speak. And when he could speak, he said, um, 
just take shelter of Lord Chaitanya and be happy. Chant Hare Krishna. And that night we all watched how Prabhupada's arrival because he was on television. And he, they, the television cameras came and, and as, when Prabhupada arrived at the airport. And then Pradumya came back. And Pradumya Purushatam came back and said that that uh, Prabhupada, he'd let, before he took rest, he, he just stood on in front of his bed and then fell back on his bed. And he rolled over and went to sleep like this. And before he went to sleep, he said, I pray to Krishna every night to please protect me from Maya. And then he went to sleep. I think of Prabhupada as, in those fi especially, you know, as exemplified by Prabhupada in his final days that he was he was fighting and 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 to the end he was he was a warrior and the, the way that I feel like that the reason I feel like that is that I was in Iran at the time and we we all went to visit Prabhupada and kind kind of one by one from Iran anyway and so I went to visit Prabhupada I was alone from Iran and then. I went into the, immediately I got to Vrindavan, I went into the room and I had a suit on from Iran. Uh, so I didn't have devotee clothes. And uh, Jai, some devotees said, you know, go get changed. You know, Jaya Dwight said, no, no, those are his preaching clothes, let him come in. So, so I went to Prabhupada and Prabhupada was laying there on the bed. And, uh, and uh, so he, I, I went over next to him, and, and then uh, Prabhupada said, so uh, what, he wanted to know what I was doing, and I said, I'm still in Iran with the Trey Rishi, and, and uh, he said, so what are you doing with your money? And I said, I'm, and at that time, fortunately, I was giving 50% uh, of money to Atreya, uh, to the project, to the, uh, to the preaching, and uh, so I told him that, and then he said, good, he, he liked that. And then, uh, I think that was, and then he put his hand on my head, and, um, and uh, that was a very uh, emotional time for me. I mean, I felt a lot of emotion from that, because Prabhupada was just laying there in, in such a, uh, an emaciated state, and, and then he just put his hand on my head, and of course I had hair, and that made me feel like, uh, whatever, that, you know, my hair was impure, and Prabhupada was, did that. So, um, so I have this, and then afterwards I watched Prabhupada, and he, he called for, uh, he called for, uh, called for Pradyumna, and uh, Pradyumna was there, and uh, so he asked for, uh, you know, to dictate, he wanted to dictate. So Pradyumna read the verse from the Bhagavatam, and, uh, and then he was uh, dictating from the verse. So I was just always impressed uh, by the fact that Prabhupada was determined. He was so, such a, he was a, like a warrior. And <clears throat> just in general, his schedule it, th that he maintained, the, the lifestyle he maintained, constantly preaching, managing, you know, leading kirtans and, and uh, managing devotees, personally managing his movement and you know, administrating his book distribution and book publishing and, and, uh, and managing his own personal spiritual life, sometimes chanting his rounds late at night. So, such a, uh, such a fighter and such a warrior, so determined to accomplish his goals, his spiritual goals. Krishna Kirtana Bhanana Tanapano Premamritam Banidhi 
धीरा धीर जनप्रिया